Buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti alla Facoltà di Medicina e Chirurgia di Tor Vergata. Vi porto i saluti a nome della facoltà che oggi ci ospita e che io ho l'onore in questo momento di presiedere. Benvenuti a tutti, magnifico Rettore, gentili colleghi e colleghi, studentesse e studenti, devo dire che l'Aula è piena di ragazzi e questo mh, ci fa particolarmente piacere. Benvenuti e in particolare eh, devo dire che è un grande onore per l'Ateneo avere ospite una persona come il professor Cicanover, come è stato detto premio Nobel per la chimica nel 2004. E, mh, dopo di me eh, saranno date delle note biografiche e scientifiche più dettagliate. Io devo dire che cercando eh, sulla vita del professor Cicanover e su alcune sue citazioni volevo leggermene una che mi ha particolarmente colpito. Io credo che il progresso della scienza debba assolutamente andare di pari passo con la crescita dell'umanità e ce ne sono anche altre molto belle, ma questa in particolare mi ha colpito e volevo oggi eh, leggervela davanti a tutti. E, mh, il professor Cicanover, come è stato detto, ha vinto il premio Nobel nel 2004 per la chimica, i suoi studi sono conosciuti in tutto il mondo e avremo poi modo di seguire con interesse la sua Lexio Magistralis. Adesso invito l'assessore all'urbanistica Giovanni Caudo di Roma Capitale a prendere la parola per un saluto istituzionale in rappresentanza del sindaco di Roma, Ignazio Marino. Prego. Studenti, magnifico rettore, preside Schillaci, gentili professori e colleghi, al personale amministrativo tutto, ma soprattutto all'illustre ospite Aaron Cicanover, rivolgo a tutti voi i saluti più sentiti da parte del sindaco di Roma, onorevole Ignazio Marina, a questo prestigioso evento che dà lustro alla nostra, eh, alla nostra città. Grazie a tutti voi che con questo straordinario evento rende ancora più evidente una peculiarità della nostra città, spesso sottosciuta anche agli stessi eh, abitanti. Roma ha al suo interno la più importante comunità scientifica del Paese. Tra istituti di ricerca, università e aziende ad alta innovazione, Roma rappresenta un polo di eccellenza. L'impegno dell'amministrazione è di ricercare le migliori sinergie tra il mondo della ricerca e le prospettive di sviluppo e di rinascita economica della nostra, della nostra città. Dopo la contrazione del settore pubblico e impiegatizio, Roma deve ora ritrovare una nuova chiave per produrre ricchezza. La piattaforma della ricerca, della formazione di fascia alta, l'eccellenza della ricerca non possono che essere questi, i punti di forza di una ridefinizione del profilo e dei caratteri della città e della capitale a cui siamo tutti chiamati per impegnarci fino in fondo. La crescita della comunità scientifica, la sua evoluzione è parte integrante della crescita e del futuro della città. Il legame tra l'evoluzione della ricerca scientifica e l'umanità ha le radici nella città, in luoghi come questi. E per questo è nella nostra capacità, come amministrazione, insieme a tutti voi, di mettere in relazione le potenzialità di luoghi come questo con la città e con il suo territorio. L'Università di Tor Vergata, magnifico Rettore Novelli, è una comunità scientifica importante per la città. Lo è nell'offerta didattica, nella ricerca dove ha delle vere e proprie eccellenze, di cui come cittadino romano non posso che essere orgoglioso. La scienza non è solo tecnica, ma ha una profonda radice umanistica. Come la città non è solo costruita o non è, non è solo un insieme di edifici e di apparati che la fanno funzionare, ma esiste solo se mettiamo al centro l'uomo e la sua cultura. Ho l'onore di rivolgermi a lei, professor Cicanove, perché credo, per quanto ho compreso del lavoro e del contributo che le ha dato alla ricerca scientifica, lei pone la centralità dell'uomo e della dimensione umanistica al centro del suo lavoro, pur dentro una forte cornice scientifica e tecnologica. 
L'anno scorso, in occasione dei 2000 anni della morte di Augusto, il Comune di Roma ha emesso una medaglia eh, ricordo, è una medaglia che porta l'effigie di uno dei principali artefici della storia millenaria di Roma. Il sindaco di Roma, Ignazio Merino, le vuole fare omaggio di questa, uh, di questa medaglia, ricordo della sua visita e del suo contributo per la ricerca uh, scientifica. Auguro a tutti voi, all'illustre ospite, un buon lavoro e una buona permanenza nella città di Roma, nella capitale del nostro Paese. Grazie a voi per tutto il lavoro che state facendo e quello che continuerete a fare. Grazie molto a questa... Grazie di... Assessore. Prende ora la parola il Professor Giuseppe Novelli, magnifico rettore dell'Università degli Studi di Roma Tor Vergada per un'introduzione alla Lectio Magistralis. Aaron, thank you very much to be here today. It's an important day for me in particular, because as you know, you remember when I started with the, to study some, some particular aspects on the ubiquitin system, that you know, when we cloned the ubiquitin degradation fusion protein 1 in 2002, it was for me an important milestone for my scientific career. You know, with the discussion in U.S. with Alex Varjaski, you and other colleagues involved in this important pathway of biochemical roots in our cells. Grazie. Grazie per essere qui, a nome di tutta la comunità accademica di Tor Vergata, per aver accettato anche di far parte del board di consultazione del Rettore che si è insediato ieri pomeriggio e con i tuoi, le tue indicazioni ieri ci hai dato una prospettiva, una prospettiva su dove deve andare l'università, l'Accademia italiana nei prossimi anni. Ci hai parlato di giovani, ci hai parlato del modo di reclutare che voi avete adottato nel vostro Paese e raggiunti risultati eccellenti nella ricerca scientifica e nella costituzione di istituti come il Weizmann, come altri che hanno fatto della ricerca il valore aggiunto non solo di un Ateneo ma di una intera società che oggi lavora, produce, inventa e innova. Io desidero ancora una volta ringraziare le persone che hanno permesso questo, questo giorno, a cui appunto Gerry Melino, qui vicino a me, la professoressa Licoccia, Pino Nisticò, tanti altri, Mauro Piacentini, il mio staff e tutti i colleghi prorettori che sono qui, che si sono prodigati per organizzare questa giornata a cui teniamo moltissimo. Chiedo pertanto al professor Gerry Melino, direttore del Dipartimento di Medicina e Chirurgia, di illustrare la figura scientifica e professionale di Aaron. Prego Gerry. Distinguished Rector, Honorable Professors, caro Aaron, and, uh, Gentili studenti, it's very important to talk to the students because uh, Aaron asked, actually asked to have a special meeting uh, uh, with the student. Um, I'll switch to Italian because the, the formality in here at the university should be in Italian because any title is given under Italian laws. <coughs> so, è un grande piacere oggi avere il professor Aaron Ciganover qui e io in un minuto, non voglio rubare tempo alla sua presentazione, vorrei presentare sia il suo profilo scientifico che è stato già accennato e sia il profilo umano. Dal punto di vista scientifico è noto a tutti che lui ha avuto l'Asker Prize nel 2000 eh, insieme con Warsharsky ed Esco per la, per la mh, scoperta del meccanismo di degradazione delle, delle proteine e nel 2015 
2004 il Nobel per la chimica e quindi eh, la, il direttore del Dipartimento di Chimica, Silvia, può conoscere questo meglio di me. Questo lavoro deriva da un uh, inizio di lavoro che lui ha fatto al Technion uh, subito dopo la laurea uh, insieme con, con Ersco con grandi difficoltà economiche, con grandi difficoltà contro la letteratura eh, scientifica e questo voglio ricordarlo alla, agli studenti che iniziano a fare il dottorato, lui era all'inizio del dottorato di ricerca, appena finito l'equivalente del dottorato lui ha iniziato allora su un argomento contro tutti i canoni e tutti i dogmi che c'erano nella letteratura scientifica, si sapeva che le proteine vivevano tutto il tempo della cellula, non era concepito una degradazione delle proteine, non era concepito un sistema di proteolisi di oltre 2 milioni di Dalton, tant'è vero che il primo lavoro significativo che ha pubblicato l'ha pubblicato oggi che parliamo di citazione di Impact Factor su un giornale da due di Impact Factor su BBRC e subito dopo ha pubblicato su JBC che oggi ha 4,7 e tutta la sua pubblicazione scientifica l'ha fatta su giornali oggi relativamente piccoli mai su giornali di, 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 eh, di, eh, di grido o di fama anche se oggi sta a, per esempio in questo momento a un lavoro in press su Cell quindi di grandissimo prestigio però le grandi scoperte lui le ha fatte con una determinazione, una convinzione e una voglia di dimostrare scientificamente in maniera più rigorosa il sistema in cui lui stava, eh, stava studiando e questo deve essere un grande esempio per gli studenti non guardiamo tanto eh, in, vanno guardate le citazioni vanno guardate le produttività ma bisogna guardare il contenuto scientifico delle scoperte scientifiche bisogna guardare i meccanismi di base lui non ha pensato di scoprire meccanismi per, la, per risolvere i tumori o altre malattie ma dopo queste sono venute sono venute adesso ci sono trial clinica sperimentazione quindi è un esempio per gli studenti di determinazione di edizione al lavoro lui ha spinto il suo eh, supervisor Ersco a lavorare, a scrivere grant, ad andare dal loro amico al Fox Chase eh, Rose a Filadelfia e quindi è nata una collaborazione, una cascata di, di, di scoperte che lo ha portato a, queste, a questo lavoro. Dal punto di vista umano, dal punto di vista umano stiamo parlando, Aaron è una persona... Lui ha, ha, è nel board del giornale pubblicato qui da Tor Vergata, Saldate Differentiation, ho mandato agli studenti una interview, una intervista eh, personale che lui eh, sulla sua vita, una vista molto lunga, in cui lui racconta la sua vita ed è secondo me superiore alla, a, a, a un articolo scientifico parla di come lui è rimasto orfano, i suoi genitori sono emigrati nella uh, British Palestine uh, nel 1947 e di come è rimasto orfano, ha lavorato, ha studiato, la zia lo ha costretto, incatenato una sedia a, 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 per, per finire il liceo, fare l'università alla, alla uh, Adassa Hospital, alla Hebrew University a Gerusalemme laureato in medicina brillantemente, eh, c'era la guerra, è dovuto nella, ha fatto il servizio militare nella marina, è veramente un esempio di, di vita, di determinazione, di dedizione ai suoi doveri e ancora oggi continua a farlo. Eh, lavorare con Aaron, collaborare con lui significa parlare di dati scientifici, significa di andare su un tavolo e mettere i dati sperimentali e parlarli. Con questo voglio semplicemente concludere, lui oggi eh, presenterà, farà un minimo accenno alla, eh, alla, eh, al lavoro sul proteosoma, parlerà anche sulla personalized medicine, su come queste ricerche possono essere indirizzate, visto che siamo nella facoltà di medicina, per migliorare le terapie personalizzate dei malati eh, a seconda delle varie malattie del, del set genetico del, del, eh, del malato e poi ci sarà un brevissimo incontro con due ricercatori di Tor Vergata e poi quello più importante con gli studenti, direttamente con gli studenti sia di, del eh, eh, pre laurea e sia con i dottorandi. Aaron, siamo molto felici che sei un amico di Tor Vergata, siamo molto felici che sei 
regolarmente d'ora in poi qui da noi a Roma e in particolare presso il nostro Ateneo e eh, ogni volta ti accoglieremo sia noi sia gli studenti a braccia aperte aspettando nuovi suggerimenti e nuovi indirizzi per l'Ateneo e per gli studenti. Grazie Aaron. Grazie professor Melino. Si invita ora il professor Cicanover ad accomodarsi al leggio. Ok, good morning everybody. Can you hear me? It's ok? I have to apologize for two things. One, that I'm speaking in English and not in your beautiful language. That always is heard to me like a song. I mean, Italian, is, Italian and Spanish are the languages that I like the most because they're always like a beautiful song, but I'm not in command of this language, so I'm speaking English. And the other apology is, uh, you know, I don't have a jacket, I'm with jeans. <laughs> Actually, uh, <laughs> this whole ceremony, thank you very much, was uh, Total surprise for me. I mean, complete surprise. Jerry and Pino and all my friends kept it in a total secret. And, uh, but, uh, you know, most of my life I spend in jeans. Uh, I hardly wear a tie. I don't know even how to put a tie. Yesterday, my good friend Pino wanted me to have a tie, so he took me, he bought me a new tie, and he already made the tie up, and all what I had is to slide it up. <laughs> so uh, I'm not a tie person. Um, and in science we are very informal, but nevertheless I would have respected this ceremony much more, but I'm on my way back home. So, uh, so that's it. So um, I, I decided um, to switch a little bit the, the topic of my talk and to talk to you about uh, my view on the historical perspective on the revolution of personalized medicine. The reason is that not only this is a broad audience, but I'm kind of a split personality. I'm not a life scientist by training, actually I'm a surgeon by training. I spent most of my, a long part of my career in medical school and then training as a surgeon, as a trauma surgeon. And rather late I decided to move to science and then we discovered the ubiquitin system. And I'm still, and I'm a faculty member in our faculty of medicine, I still go to the ground rounds, all my friends are in the hospital. Uh, so I'm kind of suffering from uh, a little bit of a schizophrenia between uh, my love to science and my love to medicine because uh, surgery is not, uh, surgeons are not known to be the ultimate scientists. They are very active. It's a little bit different than thinking of mechanism. But nevertheless, I think of surgery as one of the most efficient professions in medicine. Um, though it looks like... Uh, um, a little bit of a rude profession, you think of, for example, of oncology, if you have a solid tumor that didn't metastasize, the best way to remove it is to cut it away. If you have an abscess, you can treat the patient forever with antibiotics, not much will help. You have to drain it. So surgery is a little bit about action, a little bit of adrenaline, about, a little bit about draining, uh, about improvising in the operating theater. So I really stayed in love with the medicine and with surgery, but nevertheless, you know, from time to time you have to marry two wives in life, so <laughs> I'm married to both medicine and, uh, and science, and I decided this morning, because it's a medical school and it's a Saturday morning and I woke you up early to come here, so um, I give you a little bit of my view of the, the revolution of personalized medicine. And um, it, it's very interesting, why is it that we are entering this revolution? What is this revolution and what is the price that, uh, that we are going to pay for it? So obviously uh, the dream of people is always to stay young and we are fighting as we grow. Well, the world, the world old is not a politically correct one. Uh, we are always young and we are pushing the old age forward as we move on. But obviously it's the, the dream of people to stay young and mostly to stay healthy. So we not only want to grow old, but we want to keep our um, quality of life and uh, 
we want to cure all diseases. That's what we are doing in the laboratory, that's what we are doing in the hospital, and the question is whether at all it's possible. And looking at it historically, it's very interesting, because if we go back 100 years ago, 100 years ago, merely at the turn of the 20th century, the average lifespan was about 50 years, 50, 55 years. And people died of infectious diseases, there was no antibiotics, there was no surgery, there was no anesthesiology, there was no x-ray. If you think about x-ray, the first Nobel Prize went to Conrad Wilhelm Röntgen in 1901 for inventing the x-ray. So people even couldn't look into the body and see what's going on there. Fracture couldn't be diagnosed. And um, so everything happened in the 20th century, understanding of drugs, of mechanisms, the development of biochemistry. And people did die of simple reasons, like you got a scratch in the, in the field, tetanus or some infection, people died. Women died during delivery, therefore they had big families. And uh, you know, they tried again and again to bring more and more children, because children died, women died, and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's amazing also to look at it uh, numerically. Because if we go back 4,000 years, we go to the Greek days and to the Egyptian days, people lived about 30 years. This was the average uh, lifespan in old Egypt and Greek and here in Rome. I mean, in this beautiful city, people lived about 30 years. It took 4,000 years to extend lifespan by about 20 years. So we moved in along 4,000 years from 30 to around 50, and that's due to little understanding Louis Pasteur and some other achievements of, of, of what is about life. And then one century, single century, and we jumped from 50 to 85. What happened? Antibiotics, vaccinations, x-ray surgery, medicine, also diet, understanding diet, sewage system, hygiene, sterility. Everything was discovered in the 20th century and we jumped 35 years along one single century. It's an amazing century if we think about it. And it's all science and technology. If we think about it, it's all science and technology. And if we think of science and technology, the origin of science and technology can be traced down to one single institute. It's called the university. I always regard the university as the most important institution that was ever built by people. Because all the knowledge in the world comes from the university, from graduates of universities, from engineers, from physicians, from scientists, from teachers who teach the next generation, and so on and so forth. So I always lament the fact that politicians don't understand it. The, the, the best bank in the world to invest your dollar is the university. True, you will not get the return tomorrow. You have to wait. But at the end of the day, if you look at the economy, at the engine of the economy, the best investment bank is the university. So the 20th century brought us this, and we are still climbing up. Actually, if you look at the Time magazine of this week, there is a baby on the... I just took it, picked it up two days ago in the airport in Zurich. There is a baby on the Time magazine cover, and it says, this baby will live 140 years. So we are climbing up, but we are paying the price. When we go back 100 years, as I said, people died of simple infections. People didn't die of cancer, simply because they didn't live long enough to get cancer. Not that cancer was not there, but we didn't age to have all the mutations and all the changes that lead to cancer. People didn't die of Alzheimer because they didn't live long enough to die of Alzheimer and Parkinson and dementia. So by extending life, we also pay a price. We surface all the degenerative diseases. If we think about it, the neurodegenerative diseases, the, the vascular diseases, uh, malignancies, are all degeneration and lack of surveillance of our complex systems. What happens is that the control system goes awry. That's what happens. We are losing control over on cell division, we are accumulating mutations, we should not go into all the mechanisms. We are accumulating cholesterol in our vasculature, inflammatory processes, these are all degenerative processes. Actually, all these diseases can be put under one single umbrella, which is degeneration. So either we are degenerating the control mechanism of the cell division or, or uh, over production of cholesterol or over inflammatory processes, whatever it is, we are succumbing to new diseases that surfaced only in the 20th century because before it, we didn't see them, we didn't live long enough. Now once we are extending our lifespan to 140, we are still not sure what will happen. Even if we are going to defeat Alzheimer, and we probably will defeat Alzheimer, what's waiting for us? behind the corner, and whether we are going to succumb to, 
to new diseases. Now, this has a big meaning on medicine because it has a bearing on the ability of society to take the economical price of it. You know, if you think about uh, modern countries like Italy or like Israel or like France or Germany or the United States, we are spending almost 30% of our medical expenses on the one last two or three years of life. So for 80 years or 75 years, we are living okay, so we are needing the hospital, the physicians, and then in the last two or three years when we are hospitalized and institutionalized and uh, you know, losing our connection with the world, most of the expenses of the economical system to maintain us are going only at that period of life, which is, we can argue, is the less useful part of our life. So the question is whether, if we are going to extend life even further, whether economy will be able to sustain it, whether the public system will be able to sustain it. And that's a major problem. Obviously, we are not going to stop our efforts to extend life and to cure diseases and so on and so forth. But if you think about the distribution of expenses, it's going slowly and then all of a sudden it takes a steep uh, uphill direction. So this is not an easy question for economists, for those who plan health systems, institutions, hospitals, and so on and so forth. If you walk into the hospital here, into the polyclinic or any hospital, you will find very few children. Children are mostly immune. You will find some uh, malignancies in children, and it's always a big tragedy that a child has a malignancy. I'm the president of the Israel Cancer Society, so I can tell you that malignancies in children are only 2% of all malignancies, and then 98% are the rest when we grow old. So it's a tragedy, but the, the magnitude of it is, is, is small. So, um, so we do have a problem. We do have a problem. If you walk into the hospital, you see that most of the hospitalized people in the hospitals, whether it will be the internal medicine department, the surgery, obviously neurology, the CVA, the, the cerebrovascular accidents, the paralysis are all people at a certain age and above. So nobody will give up of living long, obviously. We are not going to give up on the achievements of medicine, but we need to understand the price. And the price is both on our health and on the health of the community and the economy. So it's not something that we should ignore. But let's go on with, uh, with where medicine is going. So obviously there was a dream in the 70s to erase cancer. Unfortunately, this dream didn't come true. Cancer has become more and more complex. We are now going deep into data sets, and we see that each cancer is accompanied by hundreds of mutations. Some of them are secondary, some of them are primary. We still don't know the culprit, who is the real cause of what's going on. And diseases are becoming more and more complex uh, to understand, and our dream to get rid of them easily uh, is going away. At the end of the day, we shall get rid of some of these diseases, but it's not going to be as easy as we thought in the 70s and the, and, and, and the 80s. Stopped working, oh. Okay, we are on. So let's talk about, if we think about medicine, about modern medicine, it's moving in three major directions. It's moving in engineering, obviously, because you know if you think about major achievements in, in medicine in recent years, they are mostly attributed to engineering. Think about cardiology, think about uh, valve replacement, think about MRI, think about CAT scan. This is all coming from engineering. It didn't come from medicine, it came from engineering. So the integration of engineering into medicine is extremely crucial. So we are going to devices. This is one way that we are going. We are going to regenerative medicine in many ways. We are going to stem cells. We are going to regenerate tissues in Parkinson. You know, we are losing the substantia nigra par compacta, so we should probably will be able to engineer cells to replace it. In diabetes, probably we should be able to engineer beta cells that will secrete now insulin to replace the cells that were regenerated. So we are moving to devices. We are going, we're moving to regenerative medicine. And traditionally, we are moving to new drugs. So these are the three main direction that we are moving, and I shall talk mostly on drugs, and we shall see where we are going with, uh, with drugs. But I think that it's very, well, maybe it's a matter of age, or 
to look back into history because there is a lot to learn from history. Uh, my students always think that uh, whenever they go into the lab, then history starts. They start with the day that they walk into the lab, and then uh, I thought so too, naively, when I was a student. But obviously I changed my view now, and I look at things uh, very differently. And it's very useful to look at the history, not only to give credit to the giants that preceded us, but also to learn lessons from history. And uh, if we look into the first revolution of drug development, it was what I called incidental revolution. So many of the blockbusters that we are using even today in medicine came from complete coincidence. Think about aspirin. Aspirin is a major drug that is being used today. It came out of a, a, a complete, uh, uh, complete coincidence. Actually, the old Egyptians 4,000 years ago knew about aspirin because the willow barks that grew on the Nile, uh, on the bank of the Nile River, when the Egyptians chewed the leaves, they, they realize that they are very bitter, but on the other hand, they have a pain alleviating characteristic. But nothing was done with it. But it's well written in old Egyptian script, 4,000 years old. We are coming to the 19th century, and uh, Charles Gerhard, the French scientist, purified salicin from the willow bark, and it was still very bitter, but it still had this pain alleviating uh, uh, characteristics. And then uh, came Felix Hoffman and some other people that worked as pharmacists at the turn of the 20th century in Bayer, in Germany. And it's very interesting that Felix Hoffman, father, contracted rheumatoid arthritis, which is an inflammation of the joints, and it is both very painful. So he thought about this uh, pain alleviation uh, characteristics of salicin, and he decided to purify salicin, to, to synthesize it, and to give it to his father. There was some chain that was put into the molecule. They acetylated it. So it's an acetyl salicylic acid in order to remove the bitterness, but not to remove the pain alleviating uh, uh, characteristics. And he synthesized powder in his basement and went to his father and gave it to him. And not only did the pain went away, but the inflammation went away. So he realized that he generated not only an anti an analgesic drug, but also an anti-inflammatory drug. It took only um, another 60 or 70 years to describe what happens there and actually what aspirin is doing. Aspirin is uh, um, inhibiting the synthesis um, of, uh, uh, of inflammatory mediators like interleukins. And that came due to the work of John Vane and many others that later on won the Nobel Prize um, for this uh, wonderful, uh, and Ben Samuelson uh, that won the Nobel Prize for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, discovery. But for many years, aspirin was used uh, as a pain alleviating drug and as an anti inflammatory. And then um, it was discovered that aspirin can prevent blood coagulation. So aspirin is now given to millions of people worldwide in order to prevent second heart attack. Because in heart attack, we get coagulation of blood in the coronary arteries. So here you see a patient that gets a heart attack. So all of a sudden, aspirin found a new news. And then, just 10 years ago, people discovered the linkage between inflammation and cancer. That chronic inflammation leads to cancer, to breast cancer, to prostate cancer, to colorectal cancer. And aspirin has become the best chemopreventive agent ever being used. I have been taking aspirin now for more than 20 years. I'm a great believer in aspirin, though I didn't have any clinical reason to take aspirin, simply because I believed in its anticoagulation properties and its anti-inflammatory properties. But a big study was stopped in the middle because the results were so clear. Aspirin reduced the incidence of colorectal carcinoma in a huge population by close to 40%. 40%. And colorectal carcinoma is a major malignancy. Major malignancy. It's not that I'm recommending aspirin to you, but just bear in mind its chemopreventive properties. And think about the discovery of aspirin. Think about the discovery of a drug today. It takes about 7 billion between two to five, six, seven billion dollars to put a new drug into the market. This drug came to the market for free. Not a single experiment, nothing, zero. Coincidence. The second drug that came to the market by coincidence is penicillin, the first antibiotic. It was a coincidental discovery by uh, Sir Alexander Fleming who got the Nobel Prize for it. And here you can see a Petri dish. 
and here are the bacteria, and Fleming was a microbiologist, he grew the bacteria, and out of absent-mindedness, he forgot the dish on the table and went away for a short weekend. He came back from the weekend, and what he found is that the spore of the fungus that was in the air fell on the Petri dish and grew up along the weekend, but that was not the end of the story, it was the beginning. He noted that there is a halo here, that the bacteria couldn't grow all the way to the border of the colony of the fungus. And he said, well, probably the fungus secretes some material that prevents the bacteria from growing. And he called this putative material antibios, antibiotics, anti-against bios life. And it took uh, uh, Howard Florey and Sir Ernst Chase another 10 years to purify. It was not Sir Alexander Fleming who purified it. It's a very interesting story, but at the end, the three of them won the Nobel Prize for the first antibiotics. And then people thought, oh, if a fungi secrete antibiotics, maybe other fungi secrete different antibiotics. So Selman Waxman discovered streptomycin, and the whole avalanche started. And we cannot imagine the world today without antibiotics. I mean, antibiotics is one of the major discoveries that allowed us to extend our lifespan, as I noted and described at the beginning of my talk. So you see, coincidence. Nothing, people didn't predict it at all, it was not money was invested there, and it was a complete coincidence. Now we move to the second uh, part of the revolution of drug development, and that's the high throughput. And many people here in the audience and many others, we are screening. We don't understand the mechanism. We have, let's say, a cancer cell that grows in culture. We have million chemical compounds. We screen. We put the million chemical compounds, one after the other, after the other, after the other, one of them will inhibit growth, one of them will inhibit cholesterol synthesis, one of them will do something, and then this is the lead. It's not a drug, it's a lead. Then we go, obviously, to toxicity, to phase one, to phase two, to phase three, takes a long time, but the beginning is a screen. We always screen without even knowing the mechanism. All what we do, we think that out of a million compounds that will screen, one will do it. So I call it uh, brute force screen. And this yielded very fruitful results. I will not go into all details, but one of the drugs, statins, that prevent cholesterol biosynthesis was discovered by Akira Endo, a, Jap a, a, a Japanese scientist, pharmacist actually, that worked in a pharma company. By coincidence, he screened the library of merely 10,000 compounds, not more, but natural compounds. He collected compounds that from plants that grew in Japan, and one of them inhibited the biosynthesis of cholesterol. He took another five years, and, uh, and the first statin came to the market in the early 70s, and statins have a huge impact on human health, huge impact. It prevented morbidity and mortality of millions of people worldwide by preventing the accumulation of cholesterol in the coronary artery, and there are millions and millions of people worldwide that are using statins. I typically do a survey, I will not do it now. I ask in the audience, who in the audience is using statin and who in the audience is using aspirin? And you will be surprised to see numerous hands are being raised up. So this is really a mass production of a drug. And this came out of screening. Now what's wrong with the screening? Why people are restless with the screening? They are restless with the screening because of the following, uh, of the following phenomenon. We know that any drug that we give to the patient, we can never predict what will happen. Either the drug will be very efficient and will have the effect that we are looking for, which will be ideal, or the drug will have only a mild effect, so it will affect the patient mildly, or the drug will have no effect, so we gave it for nothing, or the drug will have an adverse effect. It will have side effects that will have to take the patients off. Or the drug will be beneficial, but it will have such severe side effects that we nevertheless have to take the patient off the drug. We can never predict. We know the statistics, the 20%, 10%, 5%, doesn't matter, of the population will develop some side effect, some severe side effect, some mild side effect, some people may die. They will develop anaphylactic shock. They may develop, I don't know what, and they may die. And, but we can never predict. We have no tools to predict. So, if we start a treatment, let's say that we have a population of patients with breast cancer, or with prostate cancer, or with any disease, and we start the gold standard treatment, and we follow them, after five years, some of the patients will be happy, but some of the patients will be very unhappy, 
or unfortunately the family will be unhappy because they died of cancer and so on. We cannot predict. If a patient comes to the doctor and asks the doctor, tell me what will happen to me. I have a breast cancer, but it's okay. It didn't spread. It didn't metastasize and so on. The doctor tell her, you have 70% chances of surviving the disease. So she asked him, doctor, how do you know that I, I personally have 70%? He tells her, you know, this is whatever. I'm an old doctor. I have seen 2,000 patients like you. So I can tell you that by the statistics, 1,500 made it through and 500, unfortunately. And she asked him, doctor, where I am on the statistics? I'm a person, I'm not a statistic. He raises his hands. He doesn't know what to answer. He doesn't know what to answer because it's all about statistics. And there is a great need to get out of the statistics. We need to treat a patient. And we need to know what will be the fate and the outcome of the patient, not the statistics. And luckily, in 2000, there was a major step forward and the human genome project was unraveled. The first human genome was sequenced. It took seven years and about close to one billion dollars, seven years, and one billion dollars only 15 years ago to sequence one human genome. Now, in 2015, we can sequence a human genome in half an hour and in about $500. $500 in Israel is the price of a CAT scan. If I go to my, tomorrow to do an MRI or a CAT scan, it will cost me $500. So it went down to almost a routine. We still don't do it because we, we have some problems there. But we are approaching the day, which will come very soon, that sequencing our own genome will be a routine laboratory test, like we are doing routine biochemistry, glucose, phosphate, sodium, potassium, enzymes uh, in the serum, we shall do sequencing. Actually, we shall do it as a routine. And from there, we shall be able to derive a lot of information. Now, therefore, it's called personalized medicine because we are going to know the profile of the patient itself. Now, I don't want to illuse yourself, and you know it already, that not all the secrets are in the DNA. There is the RNA, and there is the proteins, and there are the post-translational modifications. It's going to be much more complicated. But we are developing technologies that are running in parallel. We can do now RNA sequencing. We can do now very sophisticated proteomic analysis. Not ideal yet. And we can go to post-translational modifications. We can measure the, the phosphoproteome, the acetylome, the sumoilome, the ubiquitome. We, we can do a lot also, and, and we can monitor the patient at a personal level. And what did happen along the years is the following. So look, for example, at uh, two cancer patients, breast cancer patients. Just I give you an example, and you all know about it. So these are two biopsies that were taken from a needle biopsy that was taken from a woman. And you see that in this cancer, here's the island, nothing happens when I stain it for a estrogen mutated estrogen receptor, and here I get a beautiful staining. Why I get a beautiful staining here? Because this woman has a mutated estrogen receptor, but this woman does not. So this woman can be treated with tamoxifen, but this woman giving her tamoxifen will be a waste of, a waste of money, but also mostly waste of hope, because tamoxifen will not help her. She doesn't have a mutated estrogen receptor. This woman may have something else. She may have a mutated EGF receptor. And for mutated EGF receptor, we have another drug, which is called Herceptin. But then we have a new woman that don't have this and don't have this, but they have a mutated progesterone receptor. So this is the third breast cancer. And then we have a fourth woman that is triple negative, and she is the worst, because we don't know what happens to her. She has a breast cancer, but none of the known mutation. But she must have a mutation somewhere. But we didn't discover it yet. So you already see that a woman that shows up with a lump in the breast can immediately, now, be classified into one of four, of four different breast cancer. Estrogen receptor mutation, progesterone receptor mutation, EGF receptor mutation, or none of the three. And I can tell you that once we are going deep into breast cancer, we shall discover 20 more. There will be 20 different breast cancers. And for those breast cancers, we need to develop treatments. But we can develop treatments only if we know the cause. 
And then once the woman will come in, we shall have to classify her into one of the 20 or 25 different breast cancers and then give her the appropriate treatment. And therefore, until now, we were blind because every woman with a breast cancer was treated with the only chemotherapy that we had or with only radiotherapy that we had or with only, you know, if the lump was obviously limited, then again, surgery was, came to our help. We could take the lump away. But if she already discovered at a late stage when she metastasized, what can we do then? So we are blind to the different mutations that drive the apparently the same disease. But we were wrong because it's not the same disease. It's the same symptoms that come up as a tumor, but it's completely different mechanistic disease. Progesterone is not estrogen, and estrogen is not EGF, and EGF is not uh, NF-kappa-B signaling. Completely different. So now we have the opportunity to go and to classify the patients according to their own disease. If beforehand we treated patients by disease, now we want to treat the disease in the context of the patient. So we flip the mirror by 180 degrees. And this is a major revolution. Now, going into it, and this taken from Lee Hood, the father of this revolution, it's not only to be, to be personalized, but it's going to be predictive because if I have the sequence of the DNA, I can look into other mutations and tell the patient what he might have in the future, to what other diseases he may be susceptible. If it's predictive, I may be able to prevent it because if I know what's going to develop, I may be able to prevent it maybe by diet, maybe by drugs, maybe by future drugs, maybe by something. But then, importantly, it's going to be participatory. And I'll tell you about it in a minute when I'm going to close my talk. It's going to be participatory because when I studied medicine, medicine was a very patronizing profession. I remember patients came to my office and they were shivering. Oh, they go to the doctor, like they go to God. Well, very poor God, God that doesn't know much. They trusted us and when they asked question, we immediately dismissed them in a patronizing way and told them, listen, Trust me, I'm your doctor. I mean, trust me. Now, it's over. There is Wikipedia, there is internet, patients are educated, they know what to ask, and if they don't like you, they will go to court to sue you, which is right, because we are not gods. We are just a little bit more knowledgeable and have accessibility to therapeutic modalities. That's all what we are. And we should respect the patient's will, and the decisions of the patients are becoming much more complex, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Therefore, every decision that is going to be made in medicine in the future will need the participation, depending on the intelligence, the ability, and so on, of the patient to take such a decision. And we should, as physicians, adapt to the patient's environment, culture, religion, beliefs, social a background and so on and so forth. It's going to be very complex and I'm going to, to talk about it um, in a minute. So this is personalized medicine in a nutshell, in a very superficial nutshell. But before closing, I just want to go and to tell you about the price that we are going to pay for it. Because there are no free lunches and we should be ready to the price. And the prices are in two, in two planes. There are technological issues here, which I don't want to go into. Not all the diseases are monogenic. Many diseases are polygenic. Cancer, for example, is worse than polygenic because cancer, one of the hallmarks of cancer is genomic instability. We start with one mutation. We start to treat the patient. The patient becomes resistant. He moves to another mutation and to another mutation and to another mutation, and then he becomes resistant to all therapeutic modalities. So... There are, these are technical issues. I'm not saying that they are simple. They are far away from being simple. But we shall handle it. I think that the most difficult one for us as a society is going, to be, is going to be the last one, which are the bioethical problems of availability of genetic information. And I'll give you several examples just to show you. You know, the most sensitive information, you know, if you think about it, if you come to the emergency room today, and with something, doesn't matter. The doctor will ask you, did your mother die of cancer or did she have something? You say, oh, my mother had, I don't know what, depression. And your father, he died of heart attack. 
and what about you? I was okay until yesterday. And, and that's it. It's very superficial and not much. And even if I have a heart attack and my father had a heart attack, what the physician can do with it? I mean, you know, okay, so it's probably a family issue. Or, or whatever, but there is not much, or you go to the insurance company and you want to insure yourself, so you're being asked a little bit about the background in your, in your family, but there is not much information that can be derived. Once we are subjecting our RN DNA and then RNA and then proteins for analysis, the amount of information that will pop up will be enormous. Now limited, but more and more it will become uh, richer and richer. Think about a simple situation. You know, one of the most common complaints that people are walking into the emergency room is chest pain, mostly for men. Men at the age of 50 or 60, they walk into the emergency room. I remember myself as a young doctor in the emergency room. In every on call for 24 hours, I seen five, seven, ten patients coming with the chest pain. And we, what you have to do is to rule out heart attack. So you take enzymes, you do ECG, you do this, you let the patient rest a little bit, and then either you send him to the intensive care unit, to the ICUCU, or you send him home, or you leave him for one day uh, for surveillance. Now, imagine the situation that now I'm taking another examination. Besides the enzymes, I'm now doing DNA sequencing. And I discover a mutation in APO4E. And APO4E is a gene, is a gene that has a predilection for high susceptibility to to Alzheimer's. Wow, and what shall I do with the information? I'm the doctor, and I discovered something. The patient didn't complain about Alzheimer. He's okay, but he has a gene of susceptibility. What do I do with the information? Do I tell the patient or don't I tell the patient? If I tell the patient, what will happen to the patient? He will get crazy, that he will have, in the may have in the future, high chances to get Alzheimer. But what can he do now? Eat eggs, uh, pray to God, which God? What, what can he do with it? Nothing. So, but then I don't know what to do with the information. I mean, to whom the information legally belongs? It belongs to me? No. It's the patient gene. It's not my gene. I just sequenced it. If I tell him, it's useless. It will just frighten him. He will go to his wife and he will tell her, you know, if tomorrow I don't remember your name, then you know what happened to me. I mean, what do we do with it? I mean, think about it. It's a, it's a, and I'll show you in a minute that it's a very realistic situation. And gradually and gradually we are discovering more and more genes that carry high susceptibility to diseases. And what do we do with the information? And how we instruct patients, patients to behave. And think about other issues. Think about insurance company, what the insurance company would like to know about us. Think about marriage even. Do you want to know? Obviously, you know, we, are, you know, we, we ignore it. We believe in big love. But, I mean, big love has its limits. We are marrying basically in circles. Typically, we want a nice wife, or the wife wants a nice husband. We want a clever one. We want a rich one. We want a successful one. We want from the same religion, from the same color, from the same this, from the same this. So even if we are great believers in love, we nevertheless select. We are selective. We are not going at random. So why not to select about health? I must tell you, I never asked my wife whether she has one kidney or not. I don't know. Maybe she has one kidney. All I know is she has two eyes, because I can see it. But is it interesting for me to know whether she carries a dominant, a, a recessive dominant uh, mutation for polycystic kidney disease? That our kids are going to suffer from it? Or whether she is, has a polyq gene that our children may suffer from Huntington? Is it interesting or not? I'm not going to answer. Just think about it. Will it be important to know more about our, with a simple blood test. I mean, nothing. Actually, we don't need even blood. We can take a buccal schmear, just a swab from my, from, my, from my mouth epithelium and sequence it, amplify it and sequence it. Is it important or not? I'm not to answer, but think about it, where we are, where we are heading. I just tell you two stories and end with that. And I'm not going to frighten you because I'll, I'll tell you again the perspective. One story is a polycystic kidney disease. It's a case that I was involved in. It was a woman of 48, 40 years old age that had a polycystic kidney disease and it was advancing. She was on a dialysis and she needed a transplant, a kidney transplant. And the only, the obvious donor was her brother. You know, the first you go to the brother. Now the brother was religious. I'm telling you a real story, an ultra-Orthodox Jew, religious. 
he escaped the family. He didn't want to live in the family because of other reasons. He went to a settlement in southern Israel, isolated himself, converted to be ultra-Orthodox, and because the family was secular, and lived his life. And uh, eventually the family came and found him and said, listen, your sister is dying or, you know, may die and we need to test you. Now, what is testing? We need to test whether your kidney is not carrying the gene itself, because if you have the disease, you may develop it also in 10 years. So we don't want the kidney. And then whether you match her um, histocompatibility-wise. So think about the problem that the brother had. Until now, he didn't know anything. And all of a sudden, he was put a Russian roulette next to his table. Because if a blood will be taken, and he will discover that he has the disease, because they are brother and sister, his life are done. He just got married, I can tell you. He was 23 years old. He just got married. He had one small baby, new wife. Everything is new. And all of a sudden, people will tell him, you have a polycystic kidney disease, and in 10 years, you're going to have a dialysis, and then you will need a transplant. I mean, so this is a Russian roulette. And then, whether, and then he obliged to give one kidney, which is still okay. We can live without a kidney. That's okay, but the major problem for him was to go through the process of diagnosing whether he has it. So this is a practical issue. Think about it. All of a sudden, from a quiet, nice life in a settlement in southern Israel, we are coming and telling him, yeah, we need the kidney. And uh, at the end of the day, it ended up happily, I can tell you, because it's a religious family. And in ultra-Orthodox religious families, they typically listen to the rabbi. And the rabbi came to him and explained him. And luckily, he was healthy, and he gave the kidney, and everything ended up happily. But think about the situation. So this is one situation. The other situation is this lady. <coughs> this lady is a wonderful lady. Beautiful. Her name is Angelina Jolie. She is an actress. And Angelina Jolie, a year and a half ago, came to the press and said, I went through an operation to remove both my ovaries and my breast. Why? Because I'm a carrier of a gene, which is called BRCA1, breast cancer number one, which happens to be a ubiquitin ligase. It belongs to the ubiquitin system, but it doesn't matter. And mutations in BRCA1 carry with them susceptibility to 80%, 80%. It's a ticking bomb. Breast cancer risk, and about 30% for ovarian cancer. So how did she check herself? Her mother died of breast cancer, and her aunt, the sister of the mother, was dying at that time of ovarian cancer. So she started to suspect that something is wrong. Ovarian cancer, breast cancer, they are linked together. So she did the test, and she found positive. She was found positive for the gene, and she decided to take a preemptive step. And you can imagine what is that for a woman, any woman, I'm not talking about Angelina Julie, to make such a decision and to make it public. Well, the public was a public service for the woman to be courageous and to come up in order to protect their lives, to remove the ticking bomb. And she did it. Now, what's behind it? We can appreciate her a lot. She's beautiful. She's nice. She's serving the public. She solved her problem, but she didn't solve the problem of her daughters or any daughters of such a woman. Because if she has a 16-year-old daughter or a 20-year-old daughter, that is now have her first boyfriend, or is now going to college, or has a fiancé, and the daughter is a carrier, what the daughter is going to do? To remove the breast? To remove the ovaries? To go every month to the doctor to check up? Nobody will want to engage such a daughter. Nobody, I mean, think about it. I don't want to even think about it. So you see what knowledge can bring us. Now, the picture is much brighter. I am not here to frighten you, and you know it, and you're also, your colleagues, you're in a medical school. If you think about the history, and with that I end, if you think about the history of medicine, its technology always preceded its application. We first discovered the technology, and then we applied it. We are on the verge now of an unbelievable technology. It just happened so that we shall be able to correct genes. I already use this technology in the lab. It's called CRISPR-Cas. We are able to take a gene and to correct it. We are able to cut it and to put a new gene instead. We are going to take a mutation and to replace the single base with the right base. So the gene will be uh, resurrected. You know, genetic therapy has been there for a long time. People tried viruses and patients died and so on. At last, I think that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. 
I predict that CRISPR Cas will get the Nobel Prize shortly, but I don't, cannot. I'm not on the committee, so I cannot say. But so, actually, we are in the regular, old, traditional, historical path of of discovery. We are not not anywhere else, except that the pathway has become very broad because the CRISPR technology and the availability of genetic information is much broader than we thought before. Because beforehand, if you thought about Nobel Prizes, think about Brown and Goldstein and cholesterol. Okay, so it was an important disease. It was heart attack. Then it was Harold Varmus with mutation uh, of, uh, of, uh, of an oncogene. So it was a, a, a critical gene. Now we are not in any particular disease and we are not in any particular gene. We are in human health. So all what happened is that the umbrella broadened and all of a sudden we found ourselves not in a little back alley of Rome, but in a highway that leads from, I don't know, from Rome to Naples, on the main highway, because it will affect any disease. Because any disease has this variability. Think about Alzheimer patients. Some Alzheimer patients go down very, very slowly, and some deteriorate like that. Think about ALS, Lou Gehrig disease. Some patients live for 10 years, some patients live for a year and a half. So the diseases are changing, are variable in their dynamics, and it's true for every disease. My Alzheimer will not be the Alzheimer of anybody else. My cancer will not be the cancer of anybody else. It will be my cancer. And therefore, it will have to be judged within my own context. And the technology is coming. The technology will be broad. It will affect all diseases. And at time, we shall know, we shall learn by sequencing and uh, by getting more information how the profile of all the diseases looks like. And this will bring to the development of new drugs and new therapeutic modalities. So for me, all I can lament is that I may not live to see the results of this revolution. But this revolution is exciting. The teaching of medicine is going to be very different than the medicine that I was taught and the medicine that is being taught today in medical school. The physician, the future physician, is going to be very different from the physician of nowadays. He will have a lot of information, a lot of significance. He will have to consult other people. And mostly, the patient will have to take a major part in the decision making. You can imagine that taking the breast away, I just brought you one example, or the ovaries away, is not a decision that any physician can take. It's the patient that has to take this, this, this decision. And this is another major part of this revolution, involving the patient in the decision making process. Thank you very much. invita la commissione ad alzarsi in piedi. Prego il professor Cicanover di raggiungere il rettore al centro della cattedra. Per me è un grande privilegio e onore conferire per la prima volta che questo titolo è stato istituito dal Senato Accademico dell'Università di Roma a Vergata il titolo di professore emerito honoris causa distinct professor al professor Aaron Cicanover come dettato dal Senato Accademico nella seduta del 17 febbraio che ha deciso di conferire questo titolo per gli alti meriti scientifici, umanitari e sociali di indubbio rilievo e chiaramente riconosciuti a livello mondiale. Just a short final comment, you know, in Israel we always uh, improvise and 
so uh, it's, thank you very much for this wonderful surprise and for the big honor bestowed upon me. I always joke that uh, my first doctorate took me seven years. This was medicine. The second one, the PhD, took me five years. And this one took me one hour. <laughs> thank you very much. La cerimonia di proclamazione è conclusa, si invitano la Commissione e il professor Ciganover ad accomodarsi nei posti loro riservati. Restano al loro posto i professori Schillaci, Licoccia e Melino per la seconda parte dell'incontro dedicato agli interventi. Oh, Jesus. Thank you. Si invita nuovamente la Commissione a prendere posto nei posti riservati. A inizio la sessione dedicata agli interventi, si prega di prendere posto. Thank you. Buongiorno, cominciamo questa seconda parte dell'incontro e do subito la parola alla professoressa Licoccia che presenta il relatore. Okay. Good morning everybody, I'm uh, uh, a little bit uh, moved uh, from the beautiful lecture we heard from uh, our colleague, if I may say so now, Professor Chicanover. Uh, And uh, I think that we're now moving into a more technical moment uh, where we have some young res younger researchers uh, presenting their work. So I'll introduce our first speaker, Professor Angelo Peschiaroli from the uh, Department of uh, Neurobiology and Cell Biology of our university, who will gonna give us our first talk this morning. Okay, uh, I, I have to say that I'm very excited to talk uh, about ubiquity in, in front of the person who discovered the old ubiquity system. And uh, for that reason, I would like to thank the rector and the organizer for this unique uh, opportunity. I will talk about the drug discovery in the ubiquitin system, and uh, I will show you some example of drug that, that are specifically targeting the uh, UPS, and also some uh, our data that, uh, in, that show inhibitors of, uh, of uh, an e 3 within lights that is called H. 
probably, as you know, the only drug that is targeting uh, UPS are the prodosome inhibitors that are currently utilized uh, in clinics, and uh, they have been uh, FDA approved in 2003 for the, the treatment of uh, some kind of tumors like uh, mantle cell lymphoma. But if you consider the, all the enzymes that participate in the UBVD nation of a protein, you have different intervention points for drug discovery. And if you consider the selectivity of this enzyme, the E3 ubidin ligase represent probably the most specific point of intervention because they binds to and degrade a relatively small subset of proteins, regulating the by only specific pathway. And uh, the, of course, uh, inhibit of E1 or E2 enzymes will have a broad effect because it will inhibit not only the products on dependent degradation of substrate, but also building signaling. In humans, there are two main classes of building ligase, the ring, finger type, and egg type, and uh, they differ from each other from the mechanism, from a mechanism point of view. And historically, the ring finger type have been extensively studied for their involvement in different pathological process, like cancer progression. And of course, many drugs targeting this kind of E3 ligase have been developed. I will uh, show you a few examples. The first one was uh, uh, a drug uh, developed by Roche that is called natlins. Natlins are small synthetic peptides that are a a molecules that are able to inhibit the binding between the three ligase MTM2 and the tumor suppressor P53. Therefore, by treat cells with uh, these uh, synthetic molecules, you induce uh, upper regulation stabilization of the P53, and depending on the cell context uh, and cell type, you can induce apoptotic fat or cell cycle arrest. Uh, these uh, uh, synthetic molecules are able to intercalate uh, in the uh, P3 binding motif in the MDM2 and are able to inhibit in vivo tumor growth. However, if you consider different uh, phase one, the uh, trinal have been uh, uh, completed, and in one uh, uh, performed in liposarcoma, this kind of drug are not so effective. Uh, only just one patient out of 20 are uh, showed a partial response, and also natlins induce severe side effects. There are other phase one clinical trials that, uh, uh, that are in progress. The other class of uh, the three ubini ligates that have been object of uh, drug design are the ACF complex. These are multimeric uh, ring type uh, ubini ligates. They are composed of a different subunit, and the receptor of this uh, complex are the F box protein. In human, there are 69 different F box protein, meaning that you can, uh, com- you can have 69 different ACF complex. The F box protein that is here binds specific specifically the substrate. And if you see all the biology of the activation of the ACF complex, you have uh, several intervention points for drug design. The CAL1 subunit of this complex is a scaffold protein that needs to be activated in order to form an active E3 ligase. This activation occurs through a process that is called nidilation, and Millennium Pharmaceutical has developed an inhibitor of this process called ML4924 that is able to inhibit the nidilation and so the activation of this E3 building ligase. This uh, compound has a potent antiproliferative effect and in preclinical studies, and also in phase one, there are different phase one uh, studies with very good results. Of course, this uh, kind of inhibitor would inhibit all the ACF complex, not only, and it's not specific for one. If you, wa- if you want to work with the selectivity, you have to work on the receptor, which is our, the F-box protein, and so design drug that inhibits the interaction of the F-box protein with the substrate. Of course, to do this, you need a high-quality crystal structure to see how the complex is formed. And this one has been uh, made for, has been, is, was possible for one class of ACF complex of, uh, is the FBOC, uh, ACF skip 2. SKIP2 is a potent oncogen. It's overexpressed in uh, all human tumors. It induced binds to and induced the degradation of, uh, of uh, 
uh, inhibitor of cell cycle progression, like P20, mainly P27, and uh, uh, different, different company has developed, have developed the inhibitor of uh, the, uh, oh, let's wait. Inhibitor of both the binding between skip two and skip one and the binding between skip two and the subset. All these inhibitors are in preclinical studies. Regarding the, as I told you, there are two families of E3 ligase, the ring type and the act type. The act, uh, act type are different from the uh, ring type because they possess a catalytic domain, which is the act domain, which is responsive, which is responsive for ubiquitin transfer from ET, E2 to the substrate. And uh, the, the substrate gener generally are bound by the WW domain that are present in this class of E3 ligands. Although this class of enzyme are uh, implicated in different uh, uh, processes, both physiological and pathological, and uh, although this class of enzyme are supposed to be easy to, be, to, to, to get target because they possess an, um, a catalytic domain, no drugs have been developed so far against this class of uh, E3-Lias. Our lab has focused attention on one member of this class that is called each. And we, together with, in collaboration with Prof Professor Chaganover, we develop a drug that is uh, able to inhibit the uh, ubiquitin ligase activity of each. But why each and not the other E3 ligase? For different reasons, each is the, probably the most characterized E3 ligase of the tumor suppressor P73. P73 is a member of the P53 family and is able to mimic to phenocopy the, the anti-proliferative uh, anti uh, effect of P53. And this issue is particularly important in, in uh, the tumor that harbor P53 mutation. And each is able to bind P73 to big with P73 and to induce the degradation of P73. Besides P73, each is also able to regulate other tumor suppressor genes like ras 5 or LAS1. And moreover, our lab has shown that if you eliminate each in cancer cell lines, you sensitize them to apoptotic, uh, to chemiotherapic induced apoptosis. In this case, doxorubicin, you, if you eliminate each, each, each expression, you increase the apoptotic effect, and this effect is uh, dependent on each because if you rest each expression, you, uh, inhibit, you decrease the apoptotic effect induced by doxorubicin. So we deve develop um, a screening strategy in order to find the inhibitor of each E3 ligase activity. This, uh, be, um, this strategy is based on uh, uh, an, an in vitro ELISA method that uh, can quantify each uh, activity. And as a readout of each activity, we measure each autobibulation activity. I forgot to tell you that many of the act type E3 ligase undergo autobibulation. And this kind of autobibulation can be used in vitro to measure how is active the E3 ligase. The system is based on uh, the immobilization of each on the plate, uh, and then uh, it was performed an in vitro ubiquitination with E1, E2, and with the flag ubiquitin. In that way, each undergo flag, uh, undergo out of flag ubiquitination that can be recognized by an anti-flag antibody that is conjugated with HRP. So in that way, you can measure and quantify by chemiluminations the amount of, of uh, out ubiquitination. The system works because uh, and is specific because it requires E1, E2, ubiquitin, and wild type H. We tested around 20,000 compounds, chemical compounds, in this kind of screening. And we select compounds that are able to inhibit each autobulation activity by more than 50%. Some of these compounds were then selected for in vitro studies. We use we analyze uh, their effect on each autobibulation or on the, uh, each mediated ubiquitination of P73. And one compound, the compound number eight, uh, has a potent activity of uh, inhibition of each A3 ligase. 
And surprisingly, in this compound, 8 is a common antidepressant drug that is called clomipramine. And the in vitro, the active metabolite of this uh, uh, antidepressant drug called norclomipramine has a, a stronger effect uh, on inhibition on the, of uh, each activity. By a mechanistic point of view, Clomipramine is able to inhibit the ubiquitin charge on E3 ligase H, and, but not the ubiquitin charge of E2 enzyme, and uh, is specific for the act type because two different ring finger uh, E3 ligase activity has, are not affected by clomipramine. Then we analyze the effect of clomipramine and norclomipramine in, uh, in the growth survive and survival of cancer, some ce or cancer cells. We uh, treated this kind uh, with these cell lines from breast, uh, bladder, and prostate with uh, clomipramine or, or norclomipramine. Uh, we observed a decrease, a marked decrease of uh, cancer cell growth. And uh, moreover, if you treat, co-treat this uh, norclomipramine with conventional chemotherapy drugs, this EMI is able to potentiate the apoptotic effect of, uh, uh, um, of uh, classical uh, chemotherapy drugs. This experiment were performed in, uh, cancer, in uh, cancer cell lines. We move also in another uh, uh, cellular model that is represented by the cancer stem cell model. Probably, as you know, one current uh, uh, model explains the relapse of the tumor of the, uh, after chemotherapy implies the presence of a subpopulation of cells called cancer stem cells or tumor incident cells that are resistant to chemotherapy and are, uh, are characterized by uh, uh, elevated ability to succeed new tumors when you inoculate the immunocompromised mice. So in collaboration with uh, uh, with Dr. Ruggero De Maria after Reginelli. Now we analyze the effect of the SMI in, uh, in three uh, uh, cancer stem cells derived from three different patients affected by uh, lung cancer, two squamous uh, carcinoma and one adenocarcinoma. And this uh, population of cancer stem cells express differentiation uh, stimulus marker, like CD133, and uh, its expression decrease if you induce the differentiation of these uh, stem cells. They are resistant to the conventional chemotherapy uh, uh, drugs, respect uh, the stem cell respect to the differentiated progeny. And when you inoculate these cells in immunocompromised uh, mice, you recapitulate the tumor of uh, origin. DSM, we treat uh, three different uh, lung cancer stem cells with DSMI, and we observe a marked reduction of cell viability, uh, that which is uh, associated with uh, a reduction of uh, aldehyde hydrogenase, which is a marker of the stem cells, and uh, an inhibition of colony, form of the colony, colony forming efficiency, meaning that uh, the DSMI, the norclomipramine, is uh, working on the stem cells, is specific for the stem cells. Cells. We also uh, analyzed the effect of uh, the SMI in combination with conventional chemotherapy drug in cancers, in lung cancer stem cells, and we, uh, uh, like we observed in. Uh, uh, in cancer cell lines, we observed that uh, the SMI is able to potentiate the cytotoxic effect of uh, uh, classical conventional chemotherapy drugs, both for cell viability and also for the expression of the aldehyde hydrogenase. Similarly to what we observe with uh, the SMI, we also phenocopy this uh, kind of uh, results in uh, cancer stem cells that do not express anymore each. And also the each depleted cells show decrease in the colon form efficiency, decrease in aldehyde hydrogenase, and uh, more apoptotic phenotype after the uh, use of, uh, after the treatment with conventional uh, therapeutic agents. Uh, so, in conclusion, I think that I hope that I convince you that targeting this uh, uh, the e 3 ubini ligase can be a promising tool in order to induce more specific pathway, and so probably to avoid side effects that uh, can be probably that, that can be generated by broad inhibitor of the ubiquitin proton system, and uh, we. Uh, 
in collaboration with Professor Chakanov, we identify clomipriming like as an inhibitor of each of the ligase, and clomipriming and all its active metabolite is able to synergize with uh, conventional genotoxin agent to induce uh, more uh, to, uh, to grow RS in, the, in both cancer cell lines and cancer stem cells. Uh, I would like to, f- think, to finish, because I think that is time, uh, to uh, thank uh, uh, Francesca Bernasonella and Mario Rossi for each inhibitor studies, Lucilla, Buongiorno Borbone for the cancer stem cell studies, of course, uh, Professor Chakanova, who is a long uh, lasting collaborator of Professor uh, Gianni Melino. Thank you. Grazie, Professor Pescheroli. Si invita ora il professor Gian Maria Fimia dell'Università del Salento e dell'Istituto Spallanzani di Roma a raggiungere il giro. Okay, so good morning everybody and I would like to thank also the organizer, the rector and the Professor Jerry Melino for this nice uh, um, invitation and the, the opportunity to present uh, our data um, together with the, the, the Nobel Prize. Um, my presentation will be a little bit more basic science. I will try to, and then I will present you our recent data on uh, which is this one? Okay. On the uh, interplay between uh, autophagy and the ubiquitin proteasome system, in particular focused on the role of the protein AMRA1. So as you maybe, maybe you, you know, autophagy is one of the major catabolic processes that is able to degrade not only protein as the proteasome that is dedicated only to protein, but to degrade most of the intracellular components inside the cells. This is achieved by sequestering the material to be degraded inside the vesicles, double membrane vesicles that are called autophagosomes, that then fuse with the lysosome where degradation occurs. Uh, autophagy is occurring uh, basically in any cells of our, our body at low level and uh, uh, ensuring the uh, turnover of the intracellular components. But the peculiarity of this process is to be induced after stress. Basically, old stress, uh, some of them are uh, indicated in this, uh, in this box, are inducing uh, uh, autophagy. And uh, uh, autophagy is induced because autophagy is trying to to uh, remove the damaged organelles. So it's trying to remove the, the, the damage caused by the stress. The damage could, 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 could be also represented by, by pathogens. And uh, after degradation, the elements that are provided, um, after, um, that are obtained uh, by autophagy can be used for uh, de novo synthesis and for production of energy. So it's a, a pro-survival pro, uh, process that is induced uh, after after stress, and uh, I would like to also to point out that uh, this response is uh, quite rapid. It's probably the, 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 the fastest ra- uh, response to any stress, uh, and is, is it transient? Uh, and to be transient is also important, because uh, otherwise the cell will digest uh, itself completely, and uh, of course will, will die. Uh, autophagy is a highly regulated process. Now we know that uh, uh, all the steps to form the autophagosomes and, uh, and to, to fuse with the lysosome are regulated by autophagy-specific genes that are called ATG. And today, I just let me mention the two complexes that are upstream, the ULK1 complex and the Beckling 1 complex that are uh, regulating the induction of the process. And one protein, LC3, maybe you can see in the, in the bottom, that is a specific marker for autophagosomes. LC3 is required for autophagosome formation and, and maturation. As you can see, in cells where, maybe in that, you, in cells where autophagy is not induced, LC3 is diffused in the cell, while when we induce autophagy, you can see there is a, a, a LC3 is dra- translocated to the autophagosome, so it's a specific marker to recognize uh, autophagy in the cells. 
One of the major questions at the moment in the autophagy field is to understand how the material that uh, has to be degraded is recognized, because autophagy turns out to be quite specific. So it's only recognized what has to be degraded, not the rest of the cell. And uh, surprisingly, uh, what was found that one of the signal that uh, allow the recognition of the damaged protein organelles is uh, ubiquitination. This was a surprise because ubiquitin was considered initially as a specific uh, signal for the proteasome degradation. And this is uh, possible because there, there are a, fa a family of proteins that are called P62 family, uh, proteins that are able on one side to bind to ubiquitin and the other side to bind to LC3. So in this way, the proteins are recruited inside the autophagosome for, the, for digestion. And as a consequence, in mice that are deficient for autophagy genes like TG5, we see a strong accumulation of ubiquitinated proteins. And this is important because this is a feature that is similar to what happened in, in human degeneration diseases such as, such as Parkinson and Huntington. But today I want to move to another uh, uh, level of regulation of this process. And uh, I would like to show you that the interplay, the cross-talk between uh, the ubiquitin proteasome system and the autophagy is not only limited to the cooperation in degradation. So they are not uh, working only to degrade similar uh, components. But uh, what we found is that two process, the two processes are able to regulate each other. And in particular, what I'm going to show you is that uh, when autophagy should be off, uh, the ubiquitin proteasome system is able to inhibit autophagy, so by degrading uh, autophagic proteins. When autophagy should be on, so the autophagy proteins are able to inhibit the ubiquitin proteasome system, inhibiting some specific uh, E3 ligases that uh, Angelo already introduced in the, in the previous talk. So, to, to explain this part of the, of, the, of the work, I have to introduce our favorite uh, autophagy protein that is called AMBRA-1. AMBRA-1 was characterized in, in our laboratory as a, a protein that interacts with the backlin complex, one of the two complex that I mentioned before, and is, able, is required for autophagy induction. In fact, without uh, AMBRA, uh, in cells it is not possible to induce autophagy. And now we know that AMBRA is regulating not only the backlin one complex, but is also regulating the ulk one complex. That is another important upstream complex regulating autophagy. So a few years ago, what we did was a proteomic screening to better understand the function of AMBRA. So we characterize all the proteins that interact with AMBRA-1. And surprisingly, maybe it's a little bit dark, the most abundant class of proteins that we found interacting with AMBRA were proteins belonging to the ubiquitin proteasome system. So we were studying an autophagy protein, and we found out that is talking with a lot of proteins involved in the proteasome degradation. Uh, this was, uh, of course, uh, <coughs> in particular, what we found is uh, that AMRA is interacting with uh, specific E3 ligases. So E3 ligases, as um, uh, Angel explained you, is the last step for uh, the ubiquitination of the protein. So it's the complex that is able to recognize uh, and ubiquitinate the, the, the targets. In, in particular, AMRA is interacting with two, pro uh, two complexes, uh, E3 complexes that are called Calin 4 and Calin 5, and the only thing you have to remember for, for this story is that AMBRA is interacting with the, uh, the adapter proteins in this complex that are called the DB1 and long in B, because you will find this name later in the, in the talk. So this was a suggestion that um, the activity of, of AMRA could be regulated by the ubiquitin proteasome system. And so we, uh, we decided to investigate this. And indeed, it was, this was the case. The first interesting observation was that uh, the levels of AMRA-1 protein is regulating during autophagy induction. These are cells culture in vitro, where autophagy is, in, is induced by removing nutrients. And this is a typical uh, way to induce autophagy. And you see that autophagy uh, AMRA-1 proteins uh, is uh, initially 
stabilized, and this correlates with the induction of autophagy. LC3 is the market that I mentioned before. So when uh, the autophagy response is induced, AMRA1 protein is stabilized. When autophagy uh, is shut down, uh, AMRA1 is degraded. You see, at least uh, the levels goes down. We demonstrate that this the regulation was uh, dependent on the uh, proteasomes because this modulation was completely lost if, you, if we use uh, an inhibitor of the proteasome. And also we demonstrate that uh, the E3 ligases responsible for AMRA1 degradation was Kalin-4, so one of the two Kalin that I mentioned uh, before. In fact, uh, if, you, if we block the activity of Kalin-4, we see an increased uh, uh, accumulation of um, AMRA-1. And also, if we block the activity of Kalin-4, uh, we see a decrease uh, in the ubiquitination of AMRA, indicating that, uh, uh, indeed, uh, Kalin-4 is the trilagase of AMRA. But the most important observation was the fact that uh, during autophagy, the levels of AMBAR were regulated by the interaction with uh, Kalin-4. In fact, what we observed was that uh, in normal conditions, so when autophagy is not uh, induced, uh, the, two pro the two complex in interacts, so the Kalin-4 and AMBAR-1 interact, uh, AMBAR levels are very low. After autophagy induction, you see the interaction, these are the interaction levels with AMRA, goes down, and the protein, the total protein amount goes up. So the D3 is not able to ubiquinate AMRA, and AMRA, AMRA is stabilized to do its job, so to induce autophagy. At later times, what we observe is that Kalin-4 is again binding to, to AMBRA, so it reassociates, and this leads to AMBRA-1 degradation. This reassociation is crucial for uh, the autophagy process because uh, the autophagy response, as I mentioned before, should be shut down after a few hours, otherwise the cells will degrade itself too much and will die. And we show, in fact, that uh, if we block the activity of uh, um, Kalin-4 by inhibiting expression DDB1, and we measure the levels of autophagy. I'm sorry about the, the, the picture, are too dark. But if we measure the number of autophagosomes, you see in normal cells, autophagosomes goes up and then goes down. While if we block uh, Kalin-4, the autophagy goes up and then stay high. And these cells, after a few hours, start to die because they cannot switch down, uh, will switch off uh, autophagy. And the same was observed if we transfect a mutant of AMRA that is not able to bind the Kalin-4. Okay, so the first part of the, the story, I show you that uh, when autophagy should be off, uh, the proteasome is able to inhibit uh, autophagy by degrading the, pro the, proto uh, the protophagy protein AMBRA1. And now in the last four slides, I will show you that uh, when autophagy should be on, so should be induced, uh, autophagy proteins are able to inhibit the ubiquitin proteasome system by inhibiting a specific uh, E3 ligases. To, uh, to show you this part of the story, I have to introduce the last actor of the story, that is mTOR. mTOR is a protein kinesis, is a nutrient sensor. So it's uh, a protein that in the cells knows if they, there are nutrients or if or the nutrients are, uh, are going down. Uh, so it's activated by nutrients and stimulates a lot of uh, anabolic processes, such, such as protein synthesis. And at the same time, of course, if I activate uh, an, an anabolism, I want to, to block a catabolism. So mTOR is able to inhibit uh, autophagy. How this works was demonstrated that, that mTOR, that is kinase, is phosphorylating ULK1, that is one of the complex that I mentioned that is upstream in the autophagy pro uh, process. And this inhibition, this phosphorylation inhibited the activity of ULK1. At the same time, high nutrients leads to the degradation of mTOR inhibitors. So the cells express inhibitors of mTOR, but they constitutionally degrade these proteins. And this is due to the proteasome uh, system. When uh, the nutrients goes down, the mTOR activity declines, and at the same time, the mTOR, the inhibitor mTOR, is stabilized and cooperates for the inhibition of the mTOR activity. In this way, ULK1 is uh, dephosphorylated and is active and can induce autophagy. 
What we have shown is that, uh, so we, we, we were interested to better understand how debtor is uh, regulated. So why debtor, how debtor is uh, degraded in, in presence of nutrients and, and is stabilized uh, uh, when uh, autophagy is induced. We demonstrate that uh, the E3 ligases that was responsible for uh, debtor degradation in uh, high nutrients uh, was Calin 5, and that this was the other Calin that interact with Umbra. And this is what shown, is shown in this panel. When, uh, when we inhibit the activity of uh, Calin 5 by uh, down regulating the expression of uh, the, uh, the protein along in B, you see there is a, a strong uh, stabilization of debtor. There is uh, the mTOR activity goes down. In fact, the phosphorylation of ULK is very low. And autophagy is induced. And this is the LC3 marker. So and then we ask, okay, so this is nine nutrients. So what happened in low nutrients? Why Calin-5 is not anymore uh, uh, degrading uh, debtor? And uh, since the AMBRA was finally interacting with, uh, with, with Calin-5, we, we hypothesized that AMBRA could play a, a role in this uh, stabilization. And this was in, indeed the case. Uh, if you use wild-type cells and uh, uh, cells de deficient for AMBRA-1 expression, use and induce autophagy by nutrient starvation, you see that debtor in normal cells is, uh, is induced, as, as, I show, as I mentioned before, while in AMBRA deficient cells, this induction is completely lost. And we were also able to demonstrate that the AMRA is directly inhibiting the Calin 5 activity. And this was shown by several approach. The first interesting observation was that uh, AMRA 1 and interact with the Calin 5 proteins more, so the, the interaction is increasing when we induce autophagy. And this is the time when uh, Deptor is stabilized. The, this, um, the second thing that we, we demonstrated was that uh, increasing AMRA-1 levels destabilized the Calin-5 complex. In fact, the interaction be within, between the scaffold Calin-5 and the adapter along in B is, uh, is reduced. So this is uh, a way how AMRA is uh, inhibiting the activity of Calin-5. And this in the inhibition of the activity of Calin-5 was the, the inhibition of uh, uh, the activity of Calin-5 by AMRA was demonstrated also in an in vitro assay. So this is the ubiquitinylation level of debtor if we put in the assay the Calin-5. And this is the ubiquitination of debtor is uh, we also add AMRA-1, so indicating that AMRA is directly inhibiting the activity of Calin-5. So in conclusion, what I show you today is that there is uh, an another level of interaction between the two major catabolic processes, the ubiquitin proteasome system and the, and the autophagy system. And this is uh, regulated by the dynamic uh, interaction of AMRA-1 with different culling complex, so with different uh, E3 ubiquitin ligases. So what we are doing at the moment is to test the relevance of this pathway in vivo situation, in particular in pathological conditions where cal the culling are uh, uh, deregulated. Finito. and are deregulated. De and we think that by interfering uh, with this interaction, so with the interaction between AMRA-1 and the Calin complex, we, will, we should be able to specifically modulate autophagy in this pathological condition. And finally, the most important slide is to thank the fantastic group of people that uh, are working with me in, in these projects. And in particular, this was the, the, the work of Manuel Antonioli, and uh, Federica Albiero. And of course, I have to thank uh, Mauro Piacentini, who gave me the, the opportunity 15 years ago to work uh, at the Spallanzani, and our fantastic uh, collaborator, uh, Daniel, who helped us with the proteomic screening, and Francesco Cecconi, who helped us with the um, ubiquitination assay and the funding. Thanks a lot. Grazie, professore. I would like to thank both speakers, Angelo and, uh, and Gian Maria, for having this uh, two short presentation after the presentation of Aaron. I would like to specify that both of them they are working in uh, Tor Vergata. I would like to also to, uh, with Tor Vergata, especially that uh, in the last slide that uh, Professor Mauro Piacentini is a professor in Tor Vergata. <laughs>
It's uh, as he said yesterday, 32 years that he works in Vergata. <laughs> it doesn't look like, but it, it is. <laughs> So uh, only really uh, 30 seconds to thank all the speakers, to thank all the, the, the people here. And now the ceremony, the protocol, I would like to say that I would like to give the, uh, the conclusive remark to uh, Professor uh, Silvia Licocha because uh, the Department of Chemistry and my department, we organized this event today. And the final word and thank for the speaker for the host today, which is the uh, dean of our medical faculty. So for me, thank you very much. Uh, the most important thing is that after this formal ceremony, there will be the student should stay here and talk with, uh, directly with Aaron Cicanove. We old people, we move out, we leave the young people, the future generation, with Aaron for, uh, for the time they, they, they like to stay together and have a coffee. Silvia, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, everybody. You will forgive an old lady for being a little bit solemn at the end of this uh, ceremony. And I heard uh, uh, our councilman Caudo and also Professor Chiganover speaking about our past and our story. And uh, remember, we are in Rome. So I'd like to join uh, in a sentence uh, by uh, a, a Latin writer what really science is all about. Uh, I'll say it in Latin and try to translate it in English. You will excuse me if it's not correct. Tavere mani mi tenebras qua necessis, se non radi solis, ne cruci da tela diei discuti anta sed nature species ratioque. It really means that it's necessary that uh, the fears that we have about uh, uh, the, the nature events or, or the gods uh, are not uh, uh, destroyed uh, by the light of the sun, but that nature's observation and understanding. And that's what it's all about, because uh, that's what we do, or we try to do. Uh, I like this sentence very much because somehow it joins my classical and scientific studies, so you will forgive me if I had to, if I wanted to propose it to you. Uh, Aaron, uh, if I may call you so, uh, since you're with colleagues right now, uh, is uh, won the Nobel Prize of, for Chemistry, uh, and that sh it, as a as director of the Department of Chemistry of this university, I'm very proud uh, to have you here, and I hope this will be just the first visit of many that will you pay to us, uh, and that we'll have a chance to talk to you about uh, the studies we do to connect, as you have done so brilliantly, the molecular structure of matter and uh, its function in biological systems, uh, leading then to the future, to what it will should be called sustainability. Sustainability is not only having, clean, having a clean planet, but also trying to ensure the highest quality of life of the world population. And that's certainly something we've heard brilliantly discussed today. So I have been so lucky in my life that you are the fifth Nobel Prize that I meet, although the only one I will have a chance to talk personally to. The first one has been Linus Pauling, and all the chemists will understand what an emotion it was to meet the man who discovered, who really understood the nature of chemical bonding. I have a copy of his book, which I treasure very much. In these years of citation and H index, Pauling's book was quoted more than 16,000 times uh, in the few years after it was published, uh, a target none of us will probably ever reach, well, certainly not me for sure, uh, then uh, it was uh, Jean-Marie Len, uh, supramolecular chemistry, Sir Harold Croto for Fullerene, uh, and uh, the last one has been Kurt Uthrich, uh, that you probably know very well, uh, since he elucidated how you can discover the, uh, the, the 3D structure of proteins with uh, an, uh, nuclear magnetic resonances. And now today you gave us uh, an idea on how uh, this uh, uh, ubiquitin system can be just a way of moving uh, to uh, 
science to people, to patients, and so the future. Uh, so, uh, and I hope uh, that everybody appreciated it as much as I did, uh, and that we can learn uh, from your story that you are, especially our younger co-workers, that we have not to fear uh, a moment with lack of financing or a difficult moment, uh, or uh, you know, see maybe a paper rejected and, and then you have to write it again. But that just should be a stimulus to move on and on and on and do the best that we can. I think I've taken up uh, more time than I wanted to, so I'd like to thank everybody for being here, and uh, I really look forward uh, to your conversation with our students, which is the most important part of the day, for sure, because the future is theirs. Thank you very much. Il professor Schillaci prende la parola per la conclusione dei lavori. Sì. Prima di concludere i lavori volevo invitare qui il professor Peschiarioli e il professor Fimia per consegnare loro un cadeau del nostro Ateneo e ringraziarvi ancora per le presentazioni che hanno fatto. Grazie. E allora andiamo a concludere questa bella giornata. E intanto volevo ringraziare lo sponsor tecnico Libdo e poi l'interprete che ci ha assistito. E ringrazio ancora il professor Cicanover per il privilegio e l'onore che ci ha fatto. Credo che questa sia una giornata storica per Tor Vergata, aver avuto qui un premio Nobel, aver sentito questa splendida lezione indubbiamente rimarrà negli anni come una data da ricordare importante per la nostra comunità scientifica. E infine ringrazio tutti i partecipanti per l'attenzione con la quale hanno seguito i lavori di questa giornata. Arrivederci a tutti e a presto.